All right. Good evening and welcome, everyone. We would like to welcome you all to Astro's DEI in Row Social Education Series. My name is Virgil Parker, and I'll be your co-moderator this evening on this segment on Black Men's Health. DEI in Row is a new social education series that focuses on diversity, equity, and belonging in radiation oncology, brought to you by the newly formed Astro Ex Officio Council on Health, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, otherwise known as CHETI, and also the Division of Education. The series focuses on conversations with our members, residents, students, the patient community, and you will also hear from leaders in various specialties and in industries on a number of topics related to DEI and belonging. The DEI in Row program is designed for us to share our experience, research, ask questions, openly discuss fundamental core concepts and structural issues within the medicine and radiation oncology community. Our hope isn't that it ends with just discussion. We hope that we inspire change, that you are encouraged to share your experiences with us and actively engage in the session. You will be able to engage in this section on Twitter by using the hashtag DEI in row. Also, you can use the chat box below. I would like to take a moment for all of our panelists this evening. We have a very well on the forum panel to uh, introduce themselves. We're going to start with the host, Dr. Kirtland DeVille. Dr. Kirtland, please. Thank you, Virgil. And it is my pleasure and privilege to co-moderate and co-host this session with you today. Um, thanks for the welcome and introduction. We're really excited to have um, our audience listeners and as well um, this uh, esteemed panel um, just with a variety of expertise uh, to share with the community today. Um, my name is Kirtland DeVille. I'm a radiation oncologist um, at Johns Hopkins School of, uh, University School of Medicine, associate professor. I'm also a clinical director of our uh, Sibley uh, Medical Campus in Radiation Oncology and medical director of the Johns Hopkins Proton Therapy Center. Um, my clinical and research interests and expertise is in prostate cancer and uh, what drew me to prostate cancer is indeed uh, much of what we'll talk about today is the awareness and, and learning as I went through my training um, that black men were more affected by prostate cancer, had a high, higher incidence um, and a higher death rate twice that of white men and really trying to understand, learn and hopefully uh, uh, alleviate that um, issue. Of course, we have lots of work to do, but um, I also have an interest in workforce diversity, um, particularly in specialties that are disproportionately underrepresented um, and that includes our own in oncology and radiation oncology and serve as the immediate past chair for um, ASHRO, the American Society of Radiation Oncology's Committee on Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, um, and recently joined um, the ASHRO board as an ex officio member, as was mentioned, for our Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council. So we are uh, ready and, and happy to do the work that needs to be done. And again, hopefully have an exciting conversation of how we can begin to do that for Black men specifically. And with that, I'll turn it over to our next, I'll turn it back to you, Virgil. Of course, no, thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. We're happy to have you with us this evening. Um, our next uh, introduction will be from Mr. Ben James Brown. Mr. Ben James. Oh, maybe having a little bit of technical difficulty. That's okay, we'll come back from Mr. Ben James. Uh, Mr. Daniel Gillison, please. Uh, feel free to introduce oh, yourself. Uh, thank you, Virgil, and um, thank you to Astro uh, for having this on this evening. It's a very important conversation. My name is Dan Gillison. I'm the CEO for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, NAMI, uh, as it's referred to. It's the largest grassroots mental health organization in the United States with uh, organizations uh, where the rubber hits the road in communities across the United States in over 650 locations. Um, 48 states and over 600 uh, other affiliate locations across the country doing the work every day to help people with their mental health. So welcome uh, to all of my uh, uh, panelists that I'm joining with this evening and I'm looking forward to learning as much as the audience is. So it's good to be here. Thank you, Mr. Gilson. Mr. Ben James, we'll, we'll loop back to you uh, right at the end. We'll just give us a moment. Um, next, we have Dr. Vaben Watts. Dr. Watts, please. 
Hi, everyone, and thank Astro. Uh, th thank you for inviting me uh, to partake in this conversation on Black men's health. My name is Vabrin Watts. I'm the director of Health Affairs, the nation's leading journal in health policy and health services research. And um, I have um, well worked in two areas. Um, those two areas are um, journalism, um, being a scientific uh, journalist, really um, um, researching things um, from psychiatric disorders to cardiovascular disease, and most recently, uh, uh, various types of, of, of hereditary cancer, including uh, prostate cancer, which um, impacts um, African-American men um, the most, as well as colorectal cancer. And um, I have been in um, my, and I also serve as health affairs as the um, director of health equity, really um, advancing racial um, equity as it relates to publishing and scholarly publishing um, journals. And I have been in the diversity and equity space for approximately what, 10 years now. So I'm very happy to be here and I'm excited to uh, spark up the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Watts. We're very happy to have you here as well. Next, we'll have Dr. Reginald Robinson. Dr. Robinson, please feel free to introduce yourself. Thank you for being hey, with us. Hey, good afternoon, brothers, and the, uh, to those out there in the listening audience. Uh, my name is Reginald Robinson. I see, Virgil, you're an HBCU alum. I'm a double HBCU alum, Morehouse undergrad and Howard Medical School. And uh, I'm a cardiologist here in Washington, D.C., a former board member of the Medical Society of the District of Columbia. Um, board member of the Greater Washington Region of the American Heart Association and past president and now president elect of the American Heart Association Eastern States Board that runs from Virginia up to Maine, including uh, West Virginia, 33 local boards under the AHA, AHA umbrella and a proud member of the 100 Black Men of D.C. here in, in, in the Washington chapter who does a lot of good work in the area. So I'm glad to be here and look forward to, to a good discussion. Thank you. We're glad to have you here with us, Bison. Next, uh, finally, last but certainly not least, is Mr. Ben James Brown. Mr. Brown, please. Hey, happy to be back. Uh, so I'm Ben James Brown. Uh, professionally, I'm a regional banking district manager with Wells Fargo Bank, uh, but I'm also a commissioner for the mayor's office of Father, Men, and Boys, uh, and the vice president of 100 Black Men here in Greater Washington, D.C. I uh, just have a love and passion uh, for making sure that uh, folks who look like me, uh, who, who walk that trail, are healthy um, uh, financially, as well as uh, making sure that because I have a 16-year-old boy, you know, what's most important to me is making sure that our youth uh, get the proper attention, medical attention uh, that they need to thrive in life. Uh, I'm honored to be on this uh, panel of esteemed uh, uh, panelists who will talk today and share their insight. Uh, and happy to be here, uh, Virgil. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited to have you with us. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Kirtland DeVille to introduce more about the program and begin the series of questions. Please, Doctor, take it away. Absolutely. So we're here to have a conversation around the challenges facing Black men and hopefully some of the tools and resources to overcome them. Um, you know, in terms of the scope of the problem, you know, we know that Black men suffer amongst the highest rates of um, often incidents, but uh, more often morbidity or mortality of most of many diseases within the United States, certainly if we think about those that are the most common and some of the highest causes of death in the country. Um, and at the same time, though, we know that very often studies have shown when um, Black men are treated with high quality, comparable care, their outcomes are just as good. Um, and so we do know that there's an opportunity that we're often missing that we can help men achieve those best outcomes um, and not have these disparities. But I think the important piece is how do we get there? How do we make those links so that people are not um, having barriers to care or encountering um, biases or issues, um, difficulties along the way? Um, and I think it's important to kind of set this, the, the stage and acknowledge where we are now, what has brought us to this important moment and facilitated this conversation in many ways. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has, uh, you know, really brought a challenge to communities and quite early on, we start to see, you know, the health um, inequities and the disparities manifesting in higher proportions of, of black and brown uh, communities, indigenous communities being affected um, by um, 
both incidence and, and again, in terms of the morbidity and the mortality um, and the risk of, of dying or having severe disease. Um, and it also highlighted that that was indeed often occurring within other, you know, um, uh, areas of, of illness, which uh, have been well documented. If I think about oncology and cancer specifically, as I mentioned, for prostate cancer, we've known that. Um, but it, it, you know, I think it highlighted the call and the need to address these health disparities more broadly as it became so, um, you know, evident within the past year. And I would say cross that at the same time with the calls for racial justice um, and the tragedies that we saw very often in front of our eyes with, you know, um, video footage of, of, of black men in particular uh, dying, you know, at the hands um, either of uh, police or even um, by individuals in the community. That has been going on, but as we're having more and more um, encounters and also, uh, again, just video and just obvious footage of these things occurring, um, we reached a critical moment, um, I think, with all of those coming together uh, and communities speaking up, and we saw, you know, the protests and uh, individuals from all backgrounds uh, speaking to the moment and saying that, you know, change, um, that the adjusted issues must be addressed and change must come. Um, so I was wondering, uh, that's a, a little bit of a long-winded intro, but um, I was wondering, each of our panelists have, um, you know, very unique perspectives. So I was hoping that each of you could comment from your own um, areas of work and expertise um, what did um, this past year's events really teach us and how has that um, brought these issues um, to the surface of what we need to do? I'll start with uh, Dan. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ville. Good to be with you all. And in and, and opening up this conversation, I'll say I may not be a bison, but I'm a jaguar. Uh, from uh, Southern University in Baton Rouge. So HBCU is represented there as well. So let me speak to this topic from the standpoint of mental health and NAMI's perspective. First of all, we know as the World Health uh, health organization said uh, 21 years ago, there is no physical health without mental health. We also know that in our community, we're all challenged to go to the doctor, to go to the physical doctor. You know, we're okay, we don't need to go. So if you think about your physical health and how it manifests itself in mental health. The other thing is that from a metric, 63% of black people think that uh, an acknowledgement of a mental health condition is a, a sign of weakness. And, and that is a, a, a very realistic metric. And what, what that does is it creates a narrative. And what we need to do is this is Men's Mental Health Month. So this is our opportunity. And this is such a great conversation that Astro is provi providing us the opportunity to have. We need to change the narrative. Um, and, and what last year did for us is it created this platform of fear, uncertainty and doubt and the fear of COVID and what it could do to your family, uh, the fear of the racial trauma and the impact that it could have on your 16 year old son or your, your uncle or, or, or whatever. Uh, the fear of the, the impact to you economically, if in fact your job was at risk. And then the fear of the elections, whichever side of the equation you were on. Uh, there was that fear, uncertainty, and doubt. What that created is more anxiety and depression. We saw our call, we have a call, um, a helpline, excuse me. We saw the calls into our helpline for services, for resources, excuse me, for resources go up by 60, 65% last year. Um, that fear, uncertainty, and doubt was also seen in fact of many of our families are in multi-generational households and some have uh, pre-existing conditions, if you will. And we were putting those family members at risk when we went to work as an essential worker and we'd come home to that multi-generational household. Um, so that uncertainty, am I going to make my grandmother sick? Is Nana gonna now get sick because I went to work? So, and we do see um, the uh, incredible numbers in terms of out of that 600,000, uh, how that impacted us in terms of the 600,000 deaths due to COVID. So that's what, uh, uh, 2020 meant to us in, in, in our space. And we're just looking to make sure that this conversation helps address the narrative that we, we need to be looking at both our physical and our mental health. Dr. Watts, perhaps we can go to you next. How has certainly there's been a lot of conversation um, within the publishing world and research about 
um, what we need to do, how we may have contributed. I wonder if you can speak to some of that in, in any of your other areas that you work in. Yeah, so um, I, I agree with with uh, with Dan. I, I mean, 2020 was definitely a year of exposure. Um, we know that health health disparities um, existed way before COVID, but it just really um, exposed uh, everything. And so, you know, even with that, there were a lot of, um, I would say, a lot of um, organizations and a lot of fields that actually had to go through, you know, just a reckoning as it relates to racism and how they contribute to racism. And I say this speaking from the aspect from working in uh, scientific publishing. I will say the the the, the United States, um, as just as itself, I mean, there is the only way I can put it is that just the the foundation of this country, racism is so embedded into the foundation of this country that you know it ends up going into various institutions and organizations. I mean, it's 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 not like that it tries to go there, but just it's, 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 it's embedded. And so when it's embedded, if, and we look at like um, scholarly publishing and scholarly publishing, there are, um, as it relates to um, racial uh, disparities, um, white researchers are 10 times more likely than researchers of color to publish. And, you know, this is important. Some, some people may say, OK, well, you know, there's more, you know, um, white research, right, white researchers. However, you have to take into um, um, the, the the fact and this research shows this, that, you know, researchers of color are more are more likely to research their own community. So if you have no one researching these certain communities, then, you know, we're not going to know as much about the I guess the health impact of, of racism or, or or like just just even looking at um, the rates of certain uh, cancers, because the thing is, is in, in order to, you know, one of the one of the ways to actually alleviate health disparities is actually getting the information out there. And if you do not have anyone who can get that information out there and get that information out there in a way that will be relevant to a particular culture, then we're just going to see the same cycle over and over again. So with, with that being said, what, what we're doing in health affairs is actually um, we have um, taken up a charge to actually um, advance um, um, racial um, equity within scholarly publishing. We're doing that through two ways, and that is through uh, making sure that we have um, uh, representat more representation of uh, researchers of color in our research, as well as research on health equity. And that health equity, as we're focused on right now, is deals with um, racial health equity. Like we just, we, we in, in 2022, we actually, um, um, February 2022, we're, we're actually having a special issue on racism and health, looking at the impact of racism on health. And that was one of the things that we focused on within the past year, where we um, actually published um, some research where we looked at how many, how often um, several medical journals mentioned uh, racism, you know, it, as it relates to how it impacts health. And the numbers were pretty much sad. I mean, they would dance around the term racism. But at, at, the, at the end of the day, you have to call you, you just have to call it what it is. And, um, you know, it, and, and I'm happy now that more journals are talking about how um, racism impact uh, people of color so that you know we can um, help to reduce some of these health disparities that are going on because a lot of it is due to discrimination and structural racism yeah it's such an important point thanks for those comments and when i think about even just in my own experience i i didn't mention it in the intro but i serve as the um a senior editor for one of our radiation oncology journals on the umbrella of ASHRO, the Advances in Radiation Oncology as the um, GU or Genetic Urinary Editor. But I remember when I first, um, early on when I joined the board, I brought to their attention that, you know, I had been publishing on diversity, equity, inclusion for about a decade. Um, and even just the classification terms, diversity, disparities, these terms were not included um, as classifications. And so what, and I started this, you know, just out of training and residency. So what does that tell a trainee, a faculty, junior faculty member? It tells you that these are potentially topics and issues. It sends the wrong message. These are potentially exactly. issues that are not valued when indeed they are. And whether it's intentional or not, it, it may, you know, it is sort of an omission 
Um, but it's not until you have that representation to actually call it out, to name it, to you know bring it to the attention um, that it was you know very quickly included. Um, and I think within this past year, there was even more of that, you know, highlighting these are the areas that we need to just having there emphasizes that we do want to hear about it. We do want to see if we are interested in this type of work. And 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 and, and really, I just want to um, respond to that. And, and that's the thing. Um, I mean, we even know that health affairs that we um, actually have submissions on health equity, but now we're more um, dedicated to valuing it. Um, you know, because because we can say you know um, increase increase, but I, I would say in, in, in a lot of parts the numbers are there. But as you said, people do not value the research. A re research that is very very it's like extremely important. Um, Mr. Uh, ben James uh, Brown, I wonder if we can go to you next. We've been talking about what this past year has um, taught us about you know the issues around Black men's health that impact um, you know our health and wellness. Absolutely. You know, most recently, actually a couple of days ago, my father uh, ended up falling out. Uh, he lives in Los Angeles, California. I'm originally from Los Angeles. And uh, I got a call at three o'clock in the morning. I hate those calls uh, that you get so early in the morning. And I was told that in his diagnosis, his blood sugar was low and um, uh, he was feeling faint all day. It, it, it really made, the, this is why you see the splint on my hand right now, <laughs> is because I know throughout the week with a uh, tremendous change that has gone on in my job uh, and, and stress with just, you know, everyday living, having a young kid at home, um, I put off a lot uh, and I haven't gone uh, to the doctor because uh, of life, you know, because I'm busy and for so many, you know, folks out there, uh, there are a ton of reasons why they don't go to the doctor and they don't get checked up. And, uh, and that call that I got from my father, you know, expedited my visit, you know, to the hospital to get everything, you know, checked out uh, so that I can uh, just have peace of mind. And I, I think about through COVID, um, one of the things that I consistently heard, especially in black families, uh, was that I was scared. I was scared, one, of the information that I was given, the information conflicted with the information that was on the news, um, and, and, and then access. Uh, a lot of Black families not having access. What I am proud of, though, is the, are the organizations that I'm a part of, like 100 Black Men, um, even my organization, uh, Wells Fargo Bank, and how they've uh, advocated and have given financial dollars to folks and time away so that they can go and get checked up um, for wellness, um, that 100 Black men stepped up and thought about, you know, what does it mean to be healthy in Black families uh, and how can we get out there and spread that message, making it fun uh, and exciting by, make, by putting on lectures uh, that we would have at least once a quarter and most recently partnering up with local uh, cycling institutions, um, uh, gyms, you know, to get folks more involved and to get them, you know, educated. Uh, all in all, uh, I, I think the, the thing that I've taken away from this is you don't know until you know, uh, dropping that fear uh, uh, and, and going and, and getting that guarantee so that you have peace of mind. The doctor left me with that and it was before I, uh, he had done the blood uh, work on me. He said, you know, before you leave here, I wanna make sure that you have peace of mind before you leave that everything is okay. And I said, do whatever you need to do. And, and I, I just advocate that everyone uh, out there that you have peace of mind at the end of the day, that everything is taken care of with you. And uh, I think COVID has taught, if it hasn't taught us one thing, life isn't promised, tomorrow isn't promised. You know, so what you can control right now, control it, take advantage of it, um, like I did. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Absolutely. And, and we'll hopefully be able to talk more about that importance of building relationships and building trust. And it sounds like the, the experience that you were having and how that's, you know, especially important for us and, and for our communities. I want to bring in Dr. Robinson, because I know you bring a wealth of uh, clinical um, expertise and experience um, in this domain and, and, you know, allow you to comment on, on the, the past year in particular and what that has uh, emphasized and brought out. Oh, thanks for the question. And I would say 
not only the last year, but a continuation of this year. So making sure people don't think that we can leave last year in the rearview mirror. You know, I, I was listening to the conversation and there are several bullet points that 2020 taught me. And, you know, one was stop, look and listen. Another one was really uh, exposure of the inequities. Another stay focused and do your own research, pivot and starting to look at social determinants of health and the trust issue. And brother Dan, you mentioned about mental health. There are people are, that are dying from COVID without having COVID. If you understand that, that means there are people that are committing suicide. There are kids and issues that we have to deal with long term that we really don't even know about yet. Um, having our kids that are exposed to different environments, adults that have been laid off. So those are big issues. When I talk about stop, look and listen, it made not only us, you know, because the people in, on this panel, we've been looking, we've been listening, we've stopped all of our lives. We know these things that have been happening, but the whole world had to collectively stop and look at George Floyd. They, the whole world had to stop and look at the inequities that COVID actually just peeled the Band-Aid off. You know, this wasn't a new situation. We, we've been dying of cardiovascular disease and it's been the leading cause of death for over a century since the last pandemic. And we still, you know, we've made a lot of progress, but we still have a lot further to go. And that leads into looking at how the social determinants of health impact death, cardiovascular issues, and just overall lifestyle. I mean, we, it, it brings to light that doctors on this panel and doctors that may be listening and in our office treating patients, we can't do it alone because you have to deal with the impact of policing on health, the impact of environment on uh, health. When you look at air quality, the impact of education, the impact of uh, just social issues. We all know about um, the, the health deserts, but there are a lot of social deserts that are out there that have just been exposed and magnified to the rest of the world that we've already known. And when I say the 2020 taught me to really do more and rely on my own research, because as my brother Ben James mentioned about trust, how do you know about if we can't understand what's coming out of the CDC as a physician and it's changing every other week, how can the community and the people that we serve actually follow and trust us to actually go and get a vaccine or get tested. And just how important that trust issue came with our people in particular and how we looked at our role in medicine. And you know, everyone quotes the Tuskegee experiment, but there are thousands of incidents outside of Tuskegee. Um, the vaccination thing is quite different, but trust is a big issue and you can't just throw it up when it's convenient. This is something that needs to be practiced on a daily basis. And I think that's where the physician patient relationship grows and we're quite lacking. And that sort of was in the, that, that really came to light um, during this time of trial and error and how we dealt with the people that really trusted us and needed us. It's almost that there's been a lack of, um, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do just in our medical training. You know, it's almost that historically it was not wanted or, you know, these topics were not broached um, or, or sort of minimally. Um, and I think we are, you know, this in particular at this moment in time, understanding, having a hopefully increasing awareness around the need to acknowledge, you know, these things, to think about them, to expand our learning, our mindset, and, um, you know, not be so, you know, sort of overly obsessed with the basic science, but ignoring all of those other factors, the, the, those social determinants, the, um, the psychosocial environment, all of these that are going to impact um, and help someone have that best outcome. I can think of that in my own, you know, area. We can design a highly technical, sophisticated, advanced treatment plan. But if we're not thinking about how the patient's going to get to our center or do they have the resources and capacity to get there every day for their, you know, six to eight weeks of treatment, if I'm not thinking about those factors, we're, we're going to have a poor outcome. And I think, um, you know, thinking about that more critically, effectively in our training is, you know, becoming more and more evident. Um, and I, I guess I can't just emphasize that enough. I think we have, um, I was gonna let Virgil uh, come in with a question. Yes, yes, thank you, Dr. Deville. I was gonna, this first question is gonna be directed to 
Mr. Gillison. Uh, Mr. Gillison, so Dr. Robertson just a few moments ago mentioned about um, the impact that media can have on Black mental health. And I believe you talked about some of the social environment and how that can have an impact on mental health, particularly for young Black sons. What role do uh, parents play in protecting the mental health of their Black children? Please. Um, well, I, I think the first thing, being a parent of a, of a son, I, I think we have to acknowledge that we've all, uh, e either as a father or as an uncle or as a big brother, we've probably all had the conversation with our sons and what not to do when stopped and what to do when stopped uh, by the police in terms of uh, that uh, interaction. I would also offer to you that uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Brother Robinson talked about was suicide in young people. And I would like to refer you all to a study, The Crisis of Black Youth Suicide in America. It's a task force that was commissioned by Representative Bonnie uh, Watson Coleman. It talks about uh, our black young men and black children uh, dying by suicide. As our doctors know here, it's all about early intervention. And early intervention also goes to mental health. And in terms of that early intervention, we're starting to see an increasing rate of suicide amongst our young, uh, our young boys. I'm not even talking about young men, I'm talking about young boys. So that's one of the things that we, we're starting to see. In terms of the media, um, as, as a, a parent, uh, it's, it's being present and making sure that you manage the, the, the conversation and the narrative versus what they, what they see um, and, and having that conversation with them about uh, what they are, what they are feeling, and what they're seeing. Um, um, our young men are no different than us older men from the standpoint of not wanting to show any signs of vulnerability. So, uh, figuring out a way to have that conversation uh, with with that young person in terms of, um, you know, I usually take my son out uh, once a once a, a month for dinner, and we, we just call it a, a a free opportunity to to talk uh, and open discussion and. Um, nothing goes back home. And uh, we just try to open up that dialogue, dialogue to have the conversation. And then every now and then, if we're sitting in front of the TV, I'll ask, what did you see? What, what did that make you feel? So it's, it's more asking questions than, than being assumptive. It's just being open. And, and we think the power is in the question versus the answer. So uh, we just, I just try to ask a lot of questions uh, when, when, when available to do that. You know, young people don't sit around their, their dads like they like we would want them to. So that's the biggest thing. And then the, the media piece is the biggest thing to, to manage um, and, and, and creating a judgment free zone to talk. I think that's the biggest thing. Judgment free. If you don't pass judgment that first or second time they talk with you, they'll keep talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. you Dr. DeVille. Hey, and, and Virgil, if I may. Yeah. Um, I just want to add on to what Dan said. I, I, I think when you think about organizations like 100 Black Men, it's a mentoring organization, right? I think there's a fallacy that every person that we mentor comes from a single family home and, uh, and it's Black men stepping in to help them. Most of the kids that uh, we mentor, there are two parents in that family. And I think what's most important is that uh, the child has someone else that they can trust and listen to as well, that they can vent to. I understand that my son and I, we talk about a whole lot of you know things, but I also understand that I've created this village of folks that he can talk to and that he can trust as well. And all of that impacts that mental health component you know, of our young black men in particular, where they feel like they can be boisterous uh, and maintain you know, that, that peace of mind and sanity uh, in themselves. So that mentor who has positive intent uh, not these boys who will find that and you know something negative, but help, who has positive intent of listening and trying to help that that, that young person. Uh, uh, can I piggyback on that? That you know we have to learn how to destigmatize mental health. Um, you know that's one of the things that we you know as a people we don't talk about things. We take it to our grave a lot of time, whether it's the issue of now a kid could go to school and be protected from that person that's at home abusing them or being able to get something outside of the home where there's more stress in the home than it is outside of the home, but destigmatizing that mental health aspect and how it can actually impact life and impact their health. I think that's something that we need to do more of. And there's a, there's a, a you know, finding a, 
a psychologist or a psychiatrist is almost like finding a, you know, a five-star MBA recruit uh, because there are not a lot of them. And, you know, we have to do our job at trying to get a list. And, you know, there's a, a physician, uh, Levi Watkins, who African-American Hop at Hopkins, who actually helped de develop the defibrillator, wrote a poem in a book called You Don't Live on My Block or You Don't Live on My Street. And that mental health piece, sometimes people are willing to talk to someone that looks like them. When I go out in the city and talk about COVID and getting the vaccine, people feel more comfortable. OK, I feel this you know, sort of thing with comfort. Everyone does it. You know, whether you're white or black or Latino, they feel more comfortable going to the physician and that looks like them that may have some cultural awareness that can actually um, help them benefit from being relaxed in that environment. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. D Dr. Walsh, did you want to take a stab at that question before I return it to Dr. DeVille? Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's so interesting that uh, Dr. Robinson um, uh, just stated what he said, you know, when, when we talk about uh, patient and physician uh, con uh, racial concordance. Uh, it, it makes me think about the study that was published uh, in 2019, and it's and it's, it's about um, does does di does diversity matter for healthcare? And it was this paper that was written by um, an African American physician, um, uh, Garrett Owens, who uh, some of us know, and um, basically it is is it's called the um, Oakland study where it looked at over a thousand black men um, just trying to um, reduce their risk for cardiovascular disease, but they were creative um, in it where they sent flyers to these men that had the pictures of a, of, of a male doctor. They were all male physicians and some received um, um, pictures of physicians who were black and others see of those who were non-black. Um, research showed that the majority of men who received the picture with a black male doctor were more likely to go and to actually, it was for a flu shot, to get a flu shot. And then once they were there, they actually talked about their risk for like cardiovascular disease. And um, those among those men who went back, um, who, who, who actually um, saw their physician, those who were treated by the male doctor were actually to follow up with like screening for cardiovascular disease. And like that study, they predicted that, you know, it could decrease uh, mortality in um, black men by like uh, 21 percent. So, you know, um, diversity does matter in um, workforce. And that's something that I have dealt with um, in this job that I'm in now and in other jobs um, that I had that uh, Dan worked with me on. Uh, uh, just looking at um, the uh, diversity as it relates to um, Black men in medicine. And so, I mean, in, in Dr. DeVille, we talked about this before that, you know, the, the uh, AAMC, the, uh, the American Association of Medical Colleges put out a, a report um, actually a couple of years ago saying, showing that it's less Black men going into medical school than, than it was in the 1960s. And that is something that we can't stand for because, you know, having diversity really impacts um, health disparities, particularly um, among um, historically marginalized um, populations, which are usually our racial and ethnic minorities. So um, I just wanted to mention that and um, just say that, you know, we really have to have a push to get more people of color, more representation into our um, actually our health profession. Thank you, Dr. Watts. That, that is an alarming statistic. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dr. DeVille, please. Yeah, no, I mean, this, definitely we can just continue along this theme. I mean, I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, even just with prostate cancer, as I went through my training and, you know, we are a specialty that has, you know, very low numbers of, of African-Americans uh, in particular. Um, and there is a broad range across all specialties. I mean, we do know that representation is decreased across all of medical training, as you mentioned. But even when you look at the spread of different specialties and which specialties people go into, um, in particular of subspecialty training, the numbers decrease more and more. But when you think about the potential impact that has to the patient and to the individual, you know, for example, one in, in five black men would be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime they may not be the afforded the opportunity to see somebody that looks like them in the position to treat them. Um, and in thinking about the study that you referenced, what is that potential 
uh, potentially um, limiting, you know, how is that limiting their outcome if they don't, you know, have the opportunity or the comfort level or the relationship along the way um, to be able to see if they want, you know, a position that looks like them. And frankly, when I, when I was a resident in training, I did my first uh, rotation in radiation oncology at the VA hospital um, at the University of Penn in West Philadelphia. So you can imagine, I was from the, from just from the outset seeing a lot of black men diagnosed with prostate cancer. And that's what really, you know, drove the connection and seeing these men and saying, you know, these look like men in my family. You know, I have, uh, you know, uncles that are military veterans who use the, the VA system and, you know, they deserve the opportunity to see someone that looks like them and that can speak to them and understand them on multiple levels, not just at, um, you know, the sort of basic interaction, but on a cultural level, on a, um, you know, on a social level as well. Um, and I'm sure that you, you, you all can attest to that as well in your own areas um, that, you, that you treat um, and see. I, I wonder, um, Dan, if we could talk a little bit, I feel like we, we do need to sort of think about kind of the historical context as well as we were, especially in the topic of mental health, um, but in just all of the the um, racial trauma uh, in particular, um, and how that manifests. How did we get to where we are in terms of the issues that we see? I know you've been in a lot of different environments, uh, in particular where where this shows up. So I wonder if we can kind of make some of those connections for folks. Yeah, the 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 miss. First of all, there's something called adverse childhood experiences. And those adverse childhood experiences many times form generational trauma that follows generation from generation to generation. Uh, we can go all the way back to the Vietnam War and even before that, as we look at trauma in, in, in the black veterans and, 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 and them getting access to treatment. Um, so we're seeing the generational trauma uh, being realized in terms of families um, um, on, a, on a daily basis. And uh, we try to uh, support in, in many ways um, as we can, but we're absolutely seeing it. And, and it comes down to, uh, I think Dr. Robinson mentioned the social determinants of health. We look at the social determinants of mental health. And in looking at those, it also goes to, you know, let's think about it. It, it didn't happen yesterday that access to treatment and access to transportation to get to treatment and access to uh, the resources is very limited. Um, uh, in, in terms of the trust and authenticity, the trust and authenticity many times uh, has not been there uh, in, 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 as you look at the systematic uh, racism, if you will. So uh, we're more likely uh, to get a different type of outcome where the treatment is treating the symptom, never getting to the root cause because of the lack of that cultural competency. And we've seen that over the years. So one of the things that I uh, was recently uh, uh, fortunate to be a part of was a uh, conversation with Dr. Satcher and a, a few others. Um, and um, uh, uh, Dr. Satcher talked about, uh, we need to train our, our professionals in the field of mental health on cultural humility because we won't see someone that looks like us. And to the two points you mentioned about the multiple levels of cultural and social, we're not going to have that opportunity. So uh, it, it, it goes to how do, we, how do we change this conversation and make sure that we um, actually have professionals going through training on cultural humility? What is it? Um, why is it important? And, and how do you demonstrate it in your practice? So, but we've seen it over the years and this trauma is not new. Um, and we want people to be able to, first of all, you, you, you can't really do anything about it until you acknowledge it. So once you acknowledge it, you can move forward. And that's what we've been working on. Can I, can I ask a question about that uh, to you, Dr. DeVille, as well as piggyback on what Dan was saying. Uh, can you, Dr. DeVille, make the point about men should die with prostate cancer than from it? Can you sort of expand on that right quick? Uh, absolutely. I think that um, we have, we know for prostate cancer that many men, if a sort of if a man gets old enough, he is eventually, there's been autopsy studies shown that, you know, that you will detect prostate cancer within the gland, the older one gets. Um, at the same time, that should be uh, indolent and kind of unaggressive prostate cancer. Um, the risk is that, and why there's a whole entire controversy around prostate screening, um, is that um, 
while the majority of prostate cancer will be detected with the unaggressive, there is a proportion of men who are at risk for being diagnosed with more aggressive prostate cancer that can be potentially lethal. And ultimately, um, in terms of, of death, prostate cancer for men is the number two um, cancer killer still in the United States. So um, much of our uh, screening, and the, the, again, it's sort of a little bit of a controversy around screening, but it's teasing out what are the specific risk factors, who is at risk, so age, but also African men um, who are black or African American race or, or have a first degree male relative are more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, and so, you know, if you look at certain guidelines, the American Cancer Society or the American Neurologic Association um, generally will advise kind of a, what we call a shared decision making approach where the physician, the primary care doctor, urologist is having a conversation with the patient around the risks and benefits um, of screening, of testing, of taking a blood test to, to see if there's enough risk that further investigation should happen looking for prostate cancer. Um, and, and then if prostate cancer is diagnosed, there's sort of a next level of need of conversation and interaction with the patient or with the physician and the patient around, is this a prostate cancer that needs to be treated? Um, or is this something that can be observed through a strategy called active surveillance, where we're just doing a monitoring of the blood test and perhaps an, an MRI or serial imaging over time um, and potentially a biopsy if needed, but um, trying to determine or sort of stratify who really needs treatment can their cancer just be monitored over time um, and ensuring that, or is this someone whose cancer does seem more aggressive or is progressing and we need to take them off of that surveillance approach and pursue treatment? Um, so are they falling into that category of, you know, uh, ultimately dying with prostate cancer that has not bothered them or not presented or posed a problem to them? Um, or are we sort of catching it uh, early enough at the point where it's not posed a problem and, and, and giving them definitive treatments? Yeah. Not 100% sure I address your question, so please follow up. If I that was have. beautiful. I wanted you to say that. And the reason I asked that question is because we're talking about health equity and that if you listen to everything that you said, black men shouldn't be dying of prostate cancer. Right. If we are out there talking about you mentioned something earlier, I just didn't want to lose that point that all of that you said beautifully about how you can detect it. It goes back to access and how we're getting exposed to being tested at an early stage, not at the aggressive stage. So thank you for sharing that with everyone so that they can know that there is hope at the end of the tunnel if we can look at trying to get better access and availability of you know, people like you that can express that. Absolutely, and, and I'm glad you highlighted that because it's often lost in the conversation. I think when the, the um, you know, part of the conversation around disparities you know, seems to be that, oh, well, you know, black men you know, simply have, you know, worse, uh, if it's a genetic risk or whatever it is, and that's just how it has to be, and they have to have worse outcomes. And I think there's abundant, you know, literature, um, especially now, you know, even in my own example for prostate cancer that shows that even if there are some underlying uh, risk factors, whether they be environmental, you know, uh, uh, genetically associated, um, or other factors that lead to higher incidence or rate of certain diseases, generally when patients receive the same outcome, so if we look at clinical trials, for example, in a very sort of well-controlled environment, when patients are enrolled, whether it's radiation or chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, the studies show that their outcomes are just as good. Black men do just as well. In fact, some in some studies, they do even better when they receive comparable care um, in controlled clinical trial environments. Um, and so we know that the conversation has to, you know, kind of evolve to the beyond this thinking of um, simply that we have to, so there are higher rates, there are higher disparities, and that's just how it has to be. Unfortunately, what we see is when we look at population data, when we look at, say, population databases or SEER, uh, sorry, like Medicare, you know, outcomes and those sorts of things, we often see that there, that is where the disparities manifest, and that has much to do with uh, as you just mentioned, that access to care, the points along the way where there's at risk for not receiving adequate care, to being lost into a system, to not being able to, you know, afford or get to treatment, the issues of underinsurance, all of those other points along the way that ultimately lead to those poor outcomes um, and less focus on whether there's some inherent biology that's making it, making it 
worse. Um, and in fact, I don't know if, you know, related to this, we could show some of the data that you had that was quite interesting. If we look at, um, you know, rates, uh, incidents and in, in life expectancy. Okay. Yeah. If you want to pull that up, we can just go over Washington, D.C. I guess, okay. while they're, I guess while they're pulling that up, um, yeah, there you go. So if you can expand that a little bit, I don't know if everyone will be able to see it. So if you look at Washington, D.C. and look at the bright red, that's Southeast D.C. The zip code of 20032, you can look at the life expectancy there, 72 years, unemployment rate, almost 17%, uninsured rate, almost 8%, uh, access to healthy food, obesity rate, 37%, and the smoking rate. So you look at 72 years of age and then go all the way to the top of the map where it's lighter. Now you're at Upper Northwest on the other side of the park, uh, 201, 20012, life expectancy, the mid 80s, you know, 15, 20 year difference. And look at the difference in un uh, uninsured rate, unemployment rate, much lower, smoking rate, much lower, the obesity rate, much lower. So zip code, almost more than anything else can predict your life expectancy, not just based on what kind of food you have, but all those things that we talked about, how they actually impact life expectancy in all areas of medicine, whether it's cancer, whether it's cardiovascular disease, and the things that we generally traditionally talk about is how someone eats and their exercise level, that's probably the peak of the pyramid. The base of the pyramid has all those factors that come into play that is really the solution where we have to, that magnifies how physicians, scientists can't do it. They need legislators, they need policing, they need ministers, uh, faith-based organizations to really come up with things. And, and we know how quickly things can be legislated, right? Where they legislate uh, Juneteenth, where they go the opposite way of delegislating, teaching uh, cultural sensitivity and, and critical race theory. So we know that that could happen if uh, we, you know, hold the our um, elected officials to feet to the fire and doing certain things. Some of the things that the Heart Association has been doing across D.C. We have one of the highest um, taxes on smoking, almost like three or four dollars per pack. And some of that revenue is supposed to go back to smoking cessation education. Same thing with sugary beverage taxes, trying to target some of the things that are uh, inherently more negatively impacted in our, in our environment. And when you look at those zip codes, uh, Brother Gillison mentioned something about trauma. And if you think about trauma, it goes even deeper than that. We talk about epigenetics or the environmental influences on medical and health, health outcomes. So their environment actually can influence a lot of things in life. So when we have people say, oh, slavery happened a long time ago, or you have all these rights now, that's, you know, we still have those generational things that have impacted our physiologic genetic basis. Um, how we eat, how we live, how we sleep, how we go to school, how we're educated. So I just wanted to throw that that map, there's a, this is a great article um, out of Time Magazine. It also shows New York City and Chicago and how you can look at the differences in uh, life expectancy. So that's Chicago and then the, the other one above that, there's another one on that that shows New York City. I think that's for, further down. Um, so you can leave the, the reference for people to go look at that. That's um, New York and looking at the red and looking at the lighter color on usually the wealthier in of the city have longer life expectancies. I wanted to add on to that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robinson. I have family that grew up in Southeast that uh, they were a part of this social determinants of health because I have a couple of uncles that, 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 that died young uh, and, and they had a lot of salt and a lot of sugar and never had access to the, the, the proper food. And they lived in that red area that you talked about. Wanted to read a couple of things to you very quickly. Black adults in the US are more likely than white adults to report persistent symptoms of emotional distress, such as sadness and hopelessness. Black adults living below the property line are more than twice as likely to report serious psychological distress than those more uh, with more financial security. So there's a lot of elements that go into this. 
Um, so uh, I just wanted to share that with you too, because hope changes a lot and access to professionals changes a lot and being able to get the, to them changes a lot. All right. Well, I know we, we, we've had a great conversation so far. It looks like we have about five minutes left. I wonder, perhaps, Virgil, if we have any questions uh, or from the chat or online, we can maybe take a question um, and then we'll kind of uh, do a wrap up with the panelists. Yes, yes. Um, so we have one question from the audience. Um, is The question is, as, as you look for a positive path forward, and consider foundational steps necessary to meet the target communities where they are, both socially and economically, what role does community play? Um, if I can summarize that, I hope um, everyone in the panel can understand it. I think they're asking, what role does the community play in helping medical professionals meet um, the, these tar the black male demographic where they are in terms of health? It's a comprehensive question, but uh, Dr. Watts, you want me to take a step, or, or Mr. Ben James, other one? Go ahead, Mr. Yeah. yeah, and 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 I can speak from the stance of um, how community matters. I, I just taught a financial literacy uh, course to some young men and women on Saturday, and one of the pieces in that talked about uh, giving back and what is that going to look like uh, as you matriculate into adulthood. And and I think about that in the communities that we serve because so many folks concentrate on self rather than concentrating on who's next to them, which includes, you know, in most cases, family and friends and whatnot. And, and so my mission has always been, what more can I do? When I look at issues on the news and out there, I, I, I ask myself, what role did I play? And, and, and that motivates me to go out and activate to try to create that change. And so the role that our community plays in advocating your next door neighbor, your, your friend that you hang out with, when was the last time you went to the doctor and got checked up, you know, that, that's gonna be instrumental in changing the mentality that it's okay to be vulnerable, to talk, to have those conversations uh, so that we can see folks uh, move more on the right track and see the numbers that Dr. Robinson had talked about uh, move in the right direction. It's just my take on that. Virgil, thank you. Virgil, you uh, facilitated a panel last week on policing in the black community in Rochester, New York, uh, Daniel Prude's community. And one of the things that we're doing, and we would say that it's important for the community to get engaged in, is something that's coming in 2021, uh, July of 2021, which is 988, which will be a new number for uh, mental health response as well as, as suicide. Uh, uh, it'll replace the National Suicide Prevention 10-digit number, but 988 is supposed to be the new number, so you get a mental health response versus a law enforcement response. Uh, the community can help by asking uh, their, their, their leadership, their political leaders, where are you on 988? What legislation is being passed? Because while the legislation has been passed, the funding has to be developed and then the infrastructure has to be built. So you can have 988 live in July of 2021, but we got to make sure that the infrastructure is there. So the right type of a response is there. Uh, a, a mental health crisis unit responds and they have somewhere to take that person that's in a mental health crisis. So 988 2021, it'll it'll be all of us in a, a surge from the community that's going to make it happen. And that, from, that sounds like a very progressive effort. Thank you, Mr. Gilson. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Robertson. Uh, another site they can go to is yourthecure.org. And that's across the country, uh, one of the American Heart Association platforms where there are a whole host of legislative issues that are out there that impact health. And you can sign on to templated letters that they already have for you to sign and send to your senators, congresspeople, uh, yourthecure.org. Thank you. Dr. Well, these are all, you know, great comments and suggestions. In fact, you know, the the la that question was a great setup. I think in terms of our um, concluding thoughts here, and really what I was going to ask the panelists is to give to share some of the resources um, and insights that they have. So, you know, I'll ask if anyone else has any additional resources that they um, would like to share. Um, you you know, please do so now. In addition, we also have on the website, the ASTRO uh, website and the DE, DEI and in, NRO in series uh, has a number of resources that the panelists have shared with the group um, on um, this conversation today for this Black Men's Town Hall. Um, different articles, some of the articles that were mentioned, the websites um, as well, 
um, and also just some reading for, for individuals who want to, you know, know more, inform themselves more, and hear more from the perspective um, of Black men's health or even um, Black men as healthcare providers, um, or some of the, um, you know, the issues and the, um, uh, speaking to that trauma, the medical incidents and things that have happened in the Black community of that have been subject to, um, that have led us to where we are now. So there are some great resources on the website. Um, any other uh, resources and comments from uh, our, our panelists? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 I do have one. Um, uh, since, since this is um, Astro, um, I actually just wrote a blog about the um, impact of colorectal cancer in African-Americans. And um, even me, you know, being um, in a health related profession, some of the things that I did not know about uh, my risk for colorectal cancer. So. Um, is on um, the Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered a website. Um, and it's, you can go on the blog and I will send this to um, to um, Astro um, to, to, to be added to that list because it's, it's very important. A lot of interesting um, information and things that we need to know, particularly as black men. <clears throat> and you can add the Black Coalition Against COVID. I know uh, uh, that's given a different perspective on some of the data and information out there about COVID as well. And I would add to our, our folks here in Washington, D.C., uh, you can follow the uh, the Mayor's Office of Father, Men and Boys. I know we have sessions every Thursday on men's health uh, as, as well as mental health, you know, awareness. Uh, so please go and follow them on Instagram to see what's coming uh, up and how we can help you. All right, wonderful. Well, I think our time is up today, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for a uh, wonderful uh, discussion. Thanks for your insight, your time, and hopefully in the audience as well, thank you for joining in and listening to this conversation. I hope we uh, stimulated and provided some resources uh, on how we can address these issues moving forward and, and have a positive impact on Black men's health and wellness. So thanks again, everyone, for your time and conversation, um, and Godspeed. Yeah.